Welcome to the Literary Digest. Please subscribe to the channel or give a like and comment on this video if you find it helpful to help us reach more people. A long time ago, before he went down in mythology as a great hero, Hercules was traveling in the hills of Greece when he came to a crossroads. On one path, a stunning goddess beckoned to him, promising a life of luxury he'd receive everything his heart desired and wouldn't experience a moment of fear, pain, or unhappiness. On the other path, a second goddess made an offer that was far less flashy. She also promised Hercules rewards, but only ones he earned himself. This path's journey would be long, requiring hard work, perseverance, and sacrifice but it would make him the person he was meant to be. This legend illustrates a dilemma we all face on a daily basis, the choice between vice and virtue the easy but ultimately empty way versus the hard but fulfilling route. According to the ancient Stoics, virtue consisted of four parts, courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom. The Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius called these components the touchstones of goodness. Everything good in life, he believed, resulted from practicing them. In this summary to Ryan Holiday's Discipline is Destiny, we'll focus on the second of these cardinal virtues, temperance, or self-discipline. We'll look at actionable ways to hone temperance in your everyday life, and how mastering it will unlock the door to fulfillment and peace of mind. Oh, and Hercules? It goes without saying that our hero chose to meet his destiny on the path of virtue. Now, the choice is yours. Chapter 1. Self-discipline doesn't deprive you, it grants you freedom. Tired of your surroundings? Hop on a plane. Dissatisfied at work? Change jobs. Crave pizza? Order it. Have an opinion? Share it. In much of today's world, people can do and access almost anything they want at the snap of a finger. And yet, with all this freedom, so many of us are so unhappy. What are we doing wrong? President Eisenhower famously said that freedom is the opportunity for self-discipline. And this is the key. Unless we have temperance, or the virtue of self-discipline, all of these things that supposedly liberate us technology, privilege, success will only leave us spiraling without direction or purpose. In other words, access without self-restraint leads to imbalance and dysfunction. Let's dive in a little deeper. We all have a lower and higher self, those inner voices constantly vying for our attention. It's Hercules's choice between vice and virtue. The side that gives up versus the side that tries. The part that clings to excess and chaos versus the part that seeks balance. Self-discipline is the ability to keep your lower self in check and strengthen your higher self. It involves working hard, practicing good habits, enduring challenges, setting boundaries, and turning a blind eye to temptations. In short, it's about living a life guided by principles, moderation, and determination. You might be thinking, hell, no. Not for me. Self-discipline? More like self-deprivation. Maybe you celebrate or even envy people who take the easy path. You might think they're having more fun or getting ahead faster. But look more closely, and you'll realize that all that glitters isn't gold. Take greed, for instance. It means you're always on the prowl for more and so never really enjoy everything you currently have. And not realizing your full potential? That's a state which breeds pain, misery, and self-loathing. Self-discipline isn't about depriving yourself, in fact, it's the opposite. It's about using control to open up a world of opportunity. Let's return to Eisenhower for a moment. When he was young, he learned a Bible verse that echoed a lesson taught by the Stoic philosopher Seneca, most powerful is he who has himself in his own power. Eisenhower carried this lesson throughout a long, unglamorous military career, all the way into his appointment to Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in World War II and then into his role as the 34th U.S. President. 
his enormous success didn't result from force, instead, he was powerful in his restraint and ability to persuade, compromise, and practice patience. It's true that it takes courage to cultivate self-discipline. But embracing this lifestyle will likely make you more successful. And, more importantly, it'll make you great no matter what happens. In the next chapters, we'll explore exactly how to manifest self-discipline physically, mentally, and spiritually. First up, the body. Chapter 2, Take Control of Your Body Before It Takes Control of You. Lou Gehrig was one of the greatest baseball players of all time. He hit 495 home runs, including 23 grand slams, and didn't miss a single game in the 17 years he played for the Yankees, a record he held for more than five decades. But Lou wasn't a natural athlete. As a kid, he was overweight and uncoordinated. So how did he end up playing 2,130 games straight, through injury and sickness, to become the legend he is today? He trained harder than anyone else and refused to quit. It's safe to say Lou knew a thing or two about self-discipline. The Stoics ate a frugal diet and exercised vigorously not so they could show off their abs, but so they could develop the physical fortitude required to face life's hardships. Being self-disciplined with regard to your body means boosting your endurance and investing in yourself for the long term so you can live longer and better none of that live fast, die young BS. It's about realizing your potential and being able to combat things like laziness, atrophy, and tough circumstances. There are many small changes you can make in your life to start conquering your body before it conquers you. First off, incorporate strenuous activities into your day. It doesn't matter what you do jujitsu, weightlifting, basketball, long walks, a marathon. But it should be physically challenging and a little uncomfortable. Seeking out discomfort is key to building temperance. Maybe you think that the point of success is not having to struggle. But here's the thing, too many comforts make us weak, dependent and afraid of losing them. By being hard on yourself, you'll toughen yourself up, you'll also make it impossible for others to be hard on you. So test yourself. Take cold showers. Try sleeping on the ground. If you can be content with less, you'll ultimately be richer, freer, and more powerful. Next, go to bed early for two reasons. One is so you get enough sleep. Be honest, do you perform better when you're well-rested, or when you're bleary-eyed and running on fumes? It may sound obvious, but getting enough sleep can change your life. You'll have more motivation and energy, and you'll make better decisions. The second reason is so you can master your mornings, those quiet, early hours when your thinking is freshest and you have the most willpower. If you get enough sleep, you can get up and get going before the day's frustrations wear you down. Finally, show up. That's what Lou Gehrig did for 17 years. Consistency is your secret superpower to success, not sure inspiration or brilliance. Lots of people are smart or talented. But not everyone puts in the work. So every day, show up for your priorities, even if you're tired, busy, or don't have to. Show up, even if it's in a small way. Go for a 10-minute jog. Write just one sentence of your novel. Once you've shown up, you'll often find that you can build on your momentum. Maybe 10 minutes of running will become half an hour. Maybe one sentence will turn into a page. Life is hard. It's filled with a lot of obstacles and situations that are out of your control. Being self-disciplined about your body isn't one of them. But the body's just the first step. In building physical temperance, you're building something even bigger, willpower. Ultimately, your body's just a training ground for your mind, which we'll dive into next. Chapter 3. Build on your physical self-discipline to temper the mind. When you practice self-discipline in your body, you empower your mind to work at its full potential. 
These aren't just flowery words, the neuroscientist Lisa Feldman Barrett has shown that brain function depends on a body's well-being. If you're physically depleted, your brain can't do its job of regulating your body. But there are lots of people out there who are physically self-disciplined. And yet their lives are still a mess. Why? Because there's more to temperance than muscle. In the end, it doesn't matter when you wake up, what you eat, or how much you push your body if your mind is constantly at the mercy of distractions, bad moods, or self-sabotaging impulses. So once you've gotten your body under control, it's time to work on the next step, moderating your mind. This involves cultivating balance in how you feel, think, and respond amid the chaos and confusion otherwise known as life. The British motto keep calm and carry on is a great example of this and Queen Elizabeth personified it to A.T. She stayed even keeled when, in 1966, a heavy cement block fell onto the royal car she was sitting in. Her response? It's a strong car. And in 1981, when a gunman ran up and fired six shots at her, she hardly flinched. There's a brief moment between each stimulus and your response. You can either use it to think, gather yourself, and wait for more information or you can succumb to destructive patterns like getting offended, jumping to conclusions, and assigning blame. Bad situations won't get better through bad reactions toward them, they'll just get worse. So hone that tiny moment of patience before you respond. Ask yourself if what you're experiencing is actually true, whether it's as annoying or upsetting as it feels. Don't let fear, anger, or prejudice override your mind. Another aspect of disciplining your mind is training yourself to focus. Take a cue from Beethoven, who'd mentally disappear in the middle of a conversation to pursue a musical idea. In his raptus, or flow state, he once told a friend he was occupied with such a lovely, deep thought that he couldn't bear to be disturbed. This may seem like indulgent behavior, but it actually takes extreme self-control to focus in a world where we're constantly bombarded by distractions. So, selfish as it may sound, practice ignoring things. See what it feels like to really commit to following your inspiration or solving that difficult problem. And don't even try to reach perfection. That's just another word for paralysis, and if you get stuck, so does your potential. An obsession with not having any flaws means missing the opportunity to get things done and learn from them. Instead of trying to be perfect, aim to do your best. And when you fall short, which you inevitably will on your diet, running plan, morning routine, don't give up. We make standards so we can aspire toward them, not so we can use them as excuses to quit. Remember, failure isn't forever. And it's a chance to grow. The philosopher Socrates knew he didn't know much. But he was sure of one thing, we can't remain as we are. The fact is, everyone can improve. Whether or not you believe that, though, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe you can grow, you will. If you don't, well, then you're also right you won't. Chapter 4 To achieve greatness, you have to align your body, mind, and spirit. According to the ancients, charioteers were the ultimate model of temperance. A charioteer had to do many things simultaneously to win a race, make their horses run as fast as possible while keeping them under control. Stay mentally focused while firmly gripping the reins. Steer around bumpy hairpin turns without crashing. Remain calm in the face of danger and often death. All while a raucous crowd cheered and jeered. A great charioteer existed on the magisterial plane they aligned themselves physically, mentally, and spiritually to perform at the highest level in one of the most stressful situations imaginable. Antoninus Aurelius was another master of true temperance. He ruled the Romans for 23 years and never put himself or his family before his subjects. He didn't complain or try to skirt his duties, he just did the work. He was said to be kind and balanced in both his personal life and as emperor of an enormous empire. 
As a testament to that, there weren't any major conflicts during his reign. His final word, before he died, was equanimitas equanimity. Balance is the reason why Antoninus was so successful and why the best charioteers raced over the finish line intact. It's the final step for each of us striving toward greatness. Self-discipline doesn't mean much in the real world if it's not balanced by kindness, compassion, and love. The journey of temperance is strict and challenging. But it's about self-actualization, not isolation. At times, people might not understand your choices, they may outright disagree with you. But as you get further along your path of virtue, you'll become kinder and more willing to turn the other cheek. You'll realize that everyone's on their own journey, doing the best they can. You're not here to judge. You're here to accept them, cheer them on, and inspire them to be better. Here's one final, very short story. The Stoic philosopher Cleanthes was walking through Athens one morning when he came across a man deriding himself for some mistake he'd made. Cleanthes paused and said, Remember, you're not talking to a bad man. As a self-disciplined person, you hold yourself to high standards, challenge your limits, and don't accept excuses. But that doesn't mean you should hurt or hate yourself when you mess up. Everyone you've ever looked up to has pressed snooze before. They've gotten angry. They've been a less than ideal partner or friend. They've fallen off the wagon in some way. If you'd witnessed those moments, would you have told them they sucked? Probably not. Instead, you would have tried to convince them it wasn't the end of the world and encouraged them to carry on. We've said it before, but Stoicism isn't about punishment. Seneca wrote, in fact no philosophical school is kindlier and gentler. Its very purpose is to be useful, bring assistance, and consider the interests not only of itself, but of all people. You're one of those people. So be your own friend. And use your self-love and support to grow and thrive in moments of difficulty and destiny. Final Summary Self-discipline isn't about deprivation, it's about being in control of your actions, thoughts, and emotions. You can honor and become part of the Stoic tradition of living virtuously by working hard, thinking hard, and holding yourself to high standards. Doing so will make you not only more productive, but happier and healthier in the long run. And if and when you fail, you'll be okay. You'll know you did your best and that you have what it takes to face life's challenges, pick yourself up when you fall, and continue on your journey with purpose and power. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe to the Literary Digest for more videos like this one. And don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you found most helpful. Until next time, keep striving for success.